introduce you all to Karen Ramming, who manages the social media for the Golden State Warriors, one of the hottest NBA brands out there right now. And I just saw where they were the first NBA team to hit 2 million followers on TikTok. So yay, that's awesome. Um, so Karen has a really uh, deep level understanding of social media, especially in the world of sports marketing. So I asked her to be here and I'm so thankful that she could join us today to share with you all some of her experiences, her career journey, and just some successes that she's seen in recent campaigns that she's been running with Golden State. So I will turn it over to you, Karen. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. And thank you so much for having me. It's great to see you again. And I hope that everybody's doing as well as possible. Um, yeah, I'm Karen. I am the Senior Manager of Social Media for the Golden State Warriors and Chase Center. Um, I'll get into a bit of what my role with the Warriors fully entails, but first I just wanted to caveat. Obviously, I'm home, work from home right now. I have a dog. I live on a busy street, so if there's like weird noises or anything, I just apologize in advance. Um, try to keep it under control, but you know, world life, things happen. Um, so I first started working in social media back in around 2015. Um, I was an undergrad at the University of Oregon studying journalism. And in the journalism school, you can choose to go in three tracks. You can either go into public relations, advertising, or reporting. I decided to go down the public relations track. Initially, I wanted to go into a more traditional PR role in the food, beverage, and hospitality industry. But I ended up getting an internship with the student section at the University of Oregon and that ultimately was my first kind of taste of working in sports. Um, and so while I was working with the student section, I was doing some PR, I was doing some marketing, I was doing some communications. And one of the things that I was helping out with was social media. And this was again, 2015, back when social media was not really a full career option. Um, you know, it was kind of the line item on a lot of people's job descriptions rather than their title. So I did that for about a year and a half. And then as I was getting ready to graduate, I decided to explore working in sports a little deeper. And so I reached out to a nonprofit organization in Eugene, Oregon called Tracktown USA. Um, I'm a track and field alum. I ran cross country and track through high school and a little bit in college. And so I figured that if I wanted to actually pursue a career in sports, I should start with a sport that's close to my heart. Um, so I landed a job there as a PR and communications assistant. I actually got that job from an informational interview, which I always like to share because, you know, everyone's like preaching about like network and meet people and set up informational interviews with professionals because you never know where they can go. And it might just kind of feel like, yeah, okay, I should do that, but they can lead to real things and real opportunities. And that was the case for me. Um, I worked as a PR and communications assistant with Tracktown for about six months. I was drafting press releases. I was managing media mix zones at you know, the NCAA championships. Um, I was just really, really deep in the world of communications for track and field. And once again, one of the line items on my job description was social media. So this was another instance where I was doing it as part of my job, but it wasn't my whole job. And I realized while I was working there that that part of my job was what I actually enjoyed the most. Um, I had the really unique blend that I enjoyed of communications from the PR side of creativity from the marketing side, and then um, data analytics from more of the like left brain side. And just like that combination worked really, really well for me. And so I started to lightly poke around and just see like, are there actual social dedicated opportunities in the sports world? Um, and I connected with somebody who worked at Pac-12 Network. We were DMing over Twitter and he mentioned like, you know, it's not a full-time job, but we are always hiring part-time freelance social media coordinators here in the Bay Area. Um, he's like, if you want, I can pass along your resume to my boss. But again, it's part-time, nothing guaranteed. And I was like, yes, please, yes. Yeah, let's just see what happens. So I ended up getting a job offer to come down to the Bay Area. The hiring manager, his name was Justin. He was very explicit. He was like, do not leave your salaried job in an affordable city to move to the most expensive city in the United States for part-time, hourly, not even guaranteed hours job. Um, I did not listen to him and I decided to move to the Bay Area. Um, luckily, I 
was bartending full time for two years leading up to that, like during my last two years of college. So I was able to still continue bartending full time in the Bay Area. Even still, part time freelance, entry level in sports, I hope that it changes. But as of now, it's just not an affordable wage to live on, um, almost regardless of where you live in the United States. And so I was living in a semi converted living room for a year. I was bartending full time. I was working in sports. It was a really, really tough year. Um, but at the end of that year, I got promoted to a full time social media coordinator. I was still bartending on the weekends. Um, and then the third year at Pac 12, I was promoted to managing the social media team. So my job shifted less from actually producing content and being in the weeds day to day covering events and more into the higher level strategy of social media analytics, um, understanding our audience, and then managing the team of coordinators who are actually producing the content. I stayed with Pac-12 for one year as the manager role, and then I was keeping an eye out for other opportunities, and I saw a job posting for this position at the Golden State Warriors, and I kind of was like, I don't have anything to lose, I might as well try. Um, I applied online. I didn't have like an in to the organization or the NBA. I didn't know anybody who was there. So I just didn't really expect to get a call back if I'm being honest, but I got an interview, got the job and I've been there for two years now. Um, it's been really, really great, both in terms of, you know, the people that I work with in the organization and culture, but also just professionally, you know, my first year we went to the finals, the second year, the season that I'm with the team, our season got, got yeah, excuse me, cut short um, early back in March. And so it's just been a kind of like wild roller coaster of um, experience for me as a professional and as a human. So my job currently is to um, develop and implement social media strategy for all Warriors and Chase Center owned handles. So on the Warriors side, this is the main at Warriors handle, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Snapchat, Weibo, which is our Chinese social media platform, and Viber, which is um, a messaging platform that's similar to like WhatsApp or WeChat that's mostly popular in Eastern Europe. Um, we also oversee Warrior Shop, so those are our retail handles, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Chase Center, which is our building that we're in. Um, most of that content is geared around concerts and live events, and those handles are Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Um, we also recently took on YouTube um, as part of our responsibilities, so we'll be adding that to our portfolio soon as well, and we're exploring some opportunities with other emerging social media apps. So that's a super like 30,000 foot view of what my job is. Um, as far as what I actually do on a day-to-day -day basis and what my team is structured like, um, I have four coordinators who currently report to me two of whom are dedicated to the Warriors and Warriors shop handles. One is dedicated to the Chase Center handles. So she came from less of a sports background and more of a concert and live event coverage background. And then one who is dedicated to our Weibo platforms. Um, so she speaks Mandarin fluently and she oversees Warriors and Chase Center Weibo. And those four coordinators, they're the ones who I like to say have the fun part of the job. Um, you know, they're the ones that get to go to every single game, be on the baseline, travel on the team plane, go to every single concert, interact with the artists. Like they're really the ones who are on the ground, like boots on the ground, capturing content and producing and getting that content out to our followers. My job on the other hand is primarily communication focused, internal communication. And that's because unsurprisingly, almost every single department ends up having a campaign, objective initiative that they want to have on social media. So I spend most of my day working with nearly every single department to figure out, okay, you have this thing coming up and you want it online. What does that mean? What handles is it right for? What's the audience that you're targeting? What's your overall like end game goal from this objective initiative or campaign? And then from there, does social media make sense for it? If so, is it our main handle? Is it our shop handle? Is it our community handle, our youth camps handle, dance handle, chase center handle? There's just so many options. And then once we determine that, then we get into the strategy around actually creating assets for whatever that kind of campaign initiative might be. Um, and that's a big emphasis that I've been working with our creative team on is making sure that whenever we do create assets, that they're geared toward the specific handle, the handle's audience, as well as 
the actual platform that they're being housed on. So, you know, the Warriors have a brand, we have a look and feel. Almost every organization has brand guidelines and a look and feel. So what you see coming out on Warriors handles is going to look different in like the colors and the structure than what you see coming out on, for the most part, Chase Center handles. And that's because while they're under the same umbrella, they're two separate brands. They need to have distinct look and feels because they are two separate brands. So when I'm working with the creative team to develop those assets after communicating with the department and figuring out their audience and objectives, we then need to say, okay, it's under this brand umbrella. It has this end objective and it's gonna be living on the, these platforms. And we've been doing a much better job this season at creating content that is platform specific. And so what that means is how people consume content on Twitter is different than how people consume content on TikTok, on Facebook, on Instagram, um, on Viber, on Snapchat, or wherever, wherever else it might be. And so for instance, Twitter, where most of the content ends up, over 80% of Twitter users consume the content native from the timeline. So that tells me two things. One, that it's very passive consumption. Um, you know, they're just scrolling. And so when you're scrolling, you need to make sure that their thumb stops scrolling and it's actually, they're watching your content or they're reading your content, whatever it may be. Um, that also tells me that when you're consuming videos on Twitter native in the timeline, the volume's gonna be off. So it needs to be audio off friendly. And that's something that we're still working on, you know, making sure that we caption all of our videos to make it easier to consume in the timeline and also to make it more inclusive for our deaf or hard of hearing audience that might not, you know, they can't hear the audio. Um, that also means that video specifically needs to be formatted differently in terms of size than still images. On Twitter in the native timeline, if you publish a vertical video, Twitter automatically crops it to a square. If you publish a 16 by nine video, it keeps it 16 by nine. So part of the objective on Twitter to make thumb stopping content and make sure that people are consuming as much of your content as possible is to optimize those videos in terms of size for the timeline. So that means we make them square because since they crop vertical to square anyway, we might as well just publish a square video. And then that way it takes up more real estate on the timeline and you have a better chance of taking in your audience's attention. That's just one platform. Um, I could do that for all of our platforms in terms of how we format our content, but I don't think that that would be terribly beneficial um, right now, especially because I know we do wanna save some time at the end for a Q and A. Um, and I know I wanted to talk specifically about TikTok and our success that we've had on TikTok because as you mentioned, we were um, not only the first NBA team, but the first North American sports team to hit 1 million and then 2 million followers on TikTok. Um, Part of this comes from being a relatively early adopter of the app on a brand side. We joined in, I believe, April of 2019, and we were only like the fourth or fifth NBA team on the app. Now the majority of NBA teams have an account on TikTok. And when we were joining TikTok, what intrigued us the most was, one, it was becoming very quickly the most popular app in the app store. You know, it was consistently like just up, 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 up in terms of app downloads. Um, in terms of million monthly active users, it was just very apparent that it was becoming the next thing. Um, and two, the publicly published demographics of TikTok show that the audience tends to skew more female and younger. And obviously being a sports team, we're always looking for the next generation of fans. So we're always trying to tap in to the youth and Gen Z and just expand our fan base as much as we can. And then anytime that we have the opportunity to reach more female fans, that's obviously a plus as well because unsurprisingly, most of our audience tends to skew male. So we decided to get on TikTok. Um, you know, it's, it had been a while since I joined a brand new app as a brand. Um, you know, for a few years there, it was kind of like the big four, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat. Um, and so it had been a while before there was a brand new app and experience for brands to play around on. So when we first joined TikTok, I naively had it in my head. I'm like, oh, this is the dancing app. Like that's just what people do, they dance. Um, I spent about two days just getting like fully immersed in the app and like letting the algorithm take me wherever it may. And I was like, okay, so I was wrong. I was very wrong. <laughs> um, 
but I think that that's one of the things that makes TikTok so successful is the niche audience groups that it has on the app. Like it almost reminds me of Reddit in that way, just like how granular you can get in terms of your interests. And so I was like, okay, this is great because now we don't have to just rely on our players like dancing to get our content. You know, we can lean into other trends and we can make some like kind of weird but cool stuff to tap into some of these niche fan groups. So that's what we started to do. Um, you know, the first couple months on any app is kind of just trying as much as you can within your brand guidelines and voice and seeing what resonates with the audience. Um, you know, you can't analyze audience data until you have an audience and content that the audience has reacted to. And I'm so sorry, the brakes were just squeaking outside. They stopped. Um, busy street. But yeah, you can't analyze your audience until you have an audience. You can't look at data until you've published content to allow your audience to react to it. So that's what we did for the first couple months. Um, you know, we tried repurposing con some content. We tried some repurposed cell phone content, studio content. We tried highlights versus personality driven. Um, and then at the end of those few months, that's when we kind of were starting to get a feel of what our audience is looking for us on TikTok. And that primarily is, you know, they want player personality. You know, highlights don't really do it on our TikTok with our audience. They're more interested in seeing our players and our coaches for who they are as human beings, seeing them like just showcase their personalities, get a little goofy, have fun off the court as well as on it because our guys, if you follow the Warriors, they like dancing and celebrating and all of that. They're a fun group. Um, so that's what we leaned into. And, you know, we make sure that TikTok specifically because it is so trend-based, we're on it every single day. We're checking the trends. We're seeing what's an emerging trend versus what's kind of fizzling out. Did we miss the boat on a trend that we wanted to do? Do we still have an opportunity to do it? Does this trend fit our brand voice? Do we even have footage to do this trend? Um, we spend a lot of time on it, but because it is such a new and hot platform, it needs that kind of time and devotion. Something else that we do on TikTok is, you know, I talk about structuring your content specific for each channel. That is like the most important thing on TikTok because it's vertical video. It is so heavy into what's trending, into trending audio, into trending hashtags, into trending effects or transitions um, that you just need to format it to fit that. Otherwise the content just isn't going to perform. And you know, we can't do that for every single piece of content. I don't think that there's enough hours in the day for somebody to create content that leans into every single trend that makes sense for them as a brand, but we do it when we can. And even if we can't lean into certain trends, um, you know, we still just get a little weird and have a little more fun than we do on some of our more well-established um, channels that we manage. Um, and yeah, that's kind of what we've been doing. We also do a lot more one-to-one -one audience interaction on TikTok. Um, you know, it's kind of easier to vet people on TikTok because the profiles aren't as built out. They don't have as much of a history. So whenever we do interact with a fan, regardless of platform, we just go through their profile and make sure that they're a good human and that we aren't interacting with somebody who we should not be interacting with. Um, and on TikTok, that's easier to do. So we can have a lot more one-to-one -one communication which on TikTok, that's another staple. You know, the audience is looking for a genuine connection between themselves and the brand. And so making sure that you engage directly with the people is very, very important. Um, but yeah, and now we're at 2.1 million. Um, we have our first kind of section of sponsored content, which is very exciting and also very important. That's something that a lot of people who work in social, you know, the conversation tends to be around creativity and content formatting an audience. But at the end of the day, if you're doing social media for a brand, you do need to be making money for the brand um, or for the company. And so we do that through monetizing directly in the platforms and some channels, but also making sure that I work really closely with our corporate partnerships team to ensure that these platforms have content pieces that are tied into corporate partner deals. Um, so that way we're helping bring revenue back to the company. And so we're currently in our mini camp that started yesterday. So our guys are in a bubble, they're working out. It's presented by Oracle NetSuite. And so um, they get TikTok inclusion as part of what we're giving them too. So they're the presenting partner of the mini camp. So whenever we post anything to TikTok that comes out of the mini camp, it's gonna be presented by them. So that's 
exciting for me. Um, I don't know if it's exciting or interesting <laughs> for you guys, but I'm pretty stoked about it. Um, and yeah, that's, I feel like I was talking for a very long time, uh, 22 minutes, but I think now if you're ready, we could probably go into a Q&A and that would be a little more interesting. Okay, man, thank you so much. That was a high level overview and then you kind of zeroed us in on social media strategy and just the unique kind of ecosystem of TikTok and how you all have tested and optimized your content for it. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Do I have any volunteers um, for chat moderation, meaning you'll review the chat and kind of send out questions to Miss Ramming? Anyone? I have to go through and pick somebody. I will. Thank you. All right, guys, so just go ahead and send your questions in. And Jalea has agreed to moderate the chat for the Q&A part. So I, I'm gonna throw out a question. I wanna know, can you tell us about, at least in TikTok, what piece of content uh, has performed the best? What are you seeing like really high success? Can you tell us kind of what the visual kind of the copy strategy was like, like what was the look and feel of one successful piece of content? So our most successful piece of content on TikTok specifically was a halftime performance actually. And it was a small, adorable little girl named Lil Zaza. And she kind of did this, um, she performed at halftime and she had this like very sassy rap that she did and we took that posted it to tiktok had the original audio and we were just kind of like let's see how this does because at that point we had been focusing mainly on players and the video just exploded and the audio gets reused and people keep coming back to it and commenting and it ended up getting tens of millions of views um and it was just yeah, so the strategy was let's see, <laughs> which like obviously whenever it's let's see and then it ends up going viral, that's always a really nice feeling. Um, as for some of the other runners up in terms of our most successful content, a lot of it, unsurprisingly, most of the videos are around Stephen Curry. Um, he's, you know, one of our most popular players on the team. He's pretty well known. And so people are always looking for Steph content and because of our access and library of archived content that we have available, we can kind of go in there and pull some of the more archived content that we have of him to re-up it, or not even re-up it, just to post it on TikTok because it had never gone there before. So one of those videos was him working out of the player facility and he does this thing sometimes when he's shooting around where somebody will, you know, pitch the ball to him and then he'll kick it like a soccer ball. Um, and it's just, it's that. And so we posted that video that ended up exploding as well. And that was just kind of the strategy behind that one was, you know, TikTok's a new app. We've published these videos multiple times to our other platforms before, but because the audience on TikTok is so new, they probably haven't seen these. And so we decided to, you know, publish some of the archived Steph content and other player content um, just to make sure that it reaches our TikTok audience. Um, someone asked, how do you and your team think of fun content to post? Um, yeah, I mean, part of it comes from some folks on the digital team outside of social. They've been with the organization for like eight plus years. So they just kind of have this like mental library of almost every moment, it seems, that has happened with the team. Um, and so whenever they hear a spitballing or if we're, you know, brainstorming with a larger digital group, they'll chime in and be like, oh yeah, like this thing from 2014 on this day. And I'm just like, how did you remember that? Um, so that's part of it. The other part of it is that we do have an actual footage archiving system where if we don't remember the specific day, we can filter by, you know, like player or time of the year, or if it was postseason, and we just kind of comb through any content that happened before, like I personally joined the team to see what would fit. Um, but yeah, most of it is honestly just kind of our coworkers' memory and knowledge of the moments that happened that they know we captured um, that might fit whatever we're trying to do with the piece of content. 
Um, someone else asked, what is the hardest part about being a social media consultant? Do you ever run out of ideas posts for the company you work for? Um, so no, I never run out of ideas. Usually the issue is that we have too many ideas and we don't have enough time or resources to make them all happen. Um, the hardest part about working in social media, and I think this is regardless of the industry you're in for social, is just because social media is so new, you know, I mentioned back in 2015, there weren't a ton of social media specific jobs. Now, when you look, you can have a social media specific job for almost any industry or company. And so it's brand new. And with anything brand new, there's still a lot of skepticism and people not understanding. They don't see the value. They just kind of think of it as this like fun thing that the company does on the side rather than it being a massive mouthpiece for the organization and a legitimate revenue driver for the organization. So the hardest thing is just, you know, fighting for my department, making sure that we have the resources we need, that we have the backup we need, um, and just making sure, trying to make sure that my coworkers um, across all levels from, you know, entry level to executives understand the purpose of my, or of my department and um, why social media matters to the organization, why it does need time, money, resources to do our jobs and do it well. Um, someone else asks, since TikTok is in the making of being banned, do you see that being a problem with the media? Um, not currently. So I've been, I mean, I'm sure as you guys have seen, TikTok was recently approved to have TikTok US be started to fit um, Trump's executive order, which I have lots of emotions on that I will not share. Um, and so right now, the app is communicating to us. We have a rep at each of the apps that we work with that it's fine. TikTok's not going away. This deal should be all that they need, um, but they'll keep us in the loop if anything changes. So as of now, um, TikTok's still operational. You can still download it in the app store. So um, we're still using it. Um, another question was, what data and analytics platforms do you use to help guide your content creation decisions? Um, so for us, the primary data that we look at is engagement. Um, engagement is the king metric for us. You know, there's some of the vanity metrics, which I mentioned, which we do celebrate, like follower count and all of that. But at the end of the day, we would rather have a smaller audience that is more engaged rather than a larger audience that's less engaged. And the reason behind that is you would rather have a customer base um, that's invested in you as a brand and that wants to have that kind of two-way street of communication and wants to engage with your content because that means that they care. Um, if you have a low engagement rate or not a lot of engagements or you're not prioritizing engagements, but instead you're prioritizing vanity metrics like impressions or followers, um, you are going to develop a follower base that might be large, but they don't necessarily care about your brand. And at the end of the day, a customer, fan, ticket buyer, whoever it may be for the industry you're in, having that person have more of a care about your brand is going to end up making them a more valuable customer, ticket buyer, fan, what have you, um, in the end. Erin, really quick, I just want to ask something uh, to tag on to that. Do you use like Google Analytics or Facebook Insights or are there like specific platforms that help you or that the team uses? Yeah, so um, we currently use Sprout Social to gather all of our metrics. Um, you know, they make it really easy. You can tag each piece of content so that way you can like filter it out and if I want to see the data around all of our in-game content, I can literally just go in and because I tagged all of our in-game content post by post, I can say I want to see the um, metrics for all the in-game content and then I want to compare it to the metrics for non-in-game content. So that's what we use for um, our metrics gathering. Someone asked, how do you stay organized in your content creation planning what do you use on a weekly basis to stay organized? So in terms of staying organized with our content creation plan, um, we have a content calendar that is, honestly, it's just on a Google Excel uh, spreadsheet and we break it down day by day. At the start of each season, I go in and I 
make each day. And then I put in the non-negotiable dates, the tentpole event dates. So those are, you know, anniversaries, um, their game days, their birthdays, just things that they're going to happen regardless. Uh, from there, we then plug in the probably going to happen dates. So these are things like social media holidays where we would like to participate, but you know, we can't guarantee it. Um, there are things like potential dates that are on our calendar for any kind of external or theme night kind of events that just aren't 100% confirmed. Um, and there anything like we're, we're constantly tracking any kind of like NBA or, or team records that the guys are coming up against. And so we try to plan out based on their career averages when they might hit those records. And so we insert those in the calendar. And then after that, um, in terms of the actual content day to day, we do take most of it day to day. Um, you know, we don't schedule things terribly far in advance because especially as this year has taught us, you can't, um, you know, the conversation online changes so often and so dramatically that if you end up trying to schedule out two weeks worth of content, you are 100% going to seem tone deaf at some time. So we take things day by day. We have, you know, at the start of each morning, like, okay, we need to hit these four things for sure. And then we can put in some evergreen content just to keep the feeds alive and, you know, like engage with our fans a little bit more. Um, and with that, we use Slack for a primary communication or Ring Central is our um, version of Zoom in GSW. And we just communicate myself and my coordinators about what we're gonna be doing like that specific day. Um, Granted, that content's like already prepared. We aren't like scrambling every morning to like make new content. It's more about making sure that when we put it on the schedule for the platforms that it still makes sense that day. And we still use that content calendar, the Google Excel spreadsheet to keep track of that. Um, that's shared outside of our department as well. So that way like our corporate partnerships team, they have access to it to see when their sponsored content is going out. Um, you know, marketing has it because we work really closely with them on a lot of initiatives. Public affairs has it for especially, you know, like our voting campaign that we're doing with them right now, just to keep everybody informed. So yeah, Google Excel spreadsheet, not too fancy, um, but it, it gets the job done. Um, someone asked, I heard you mention a little something about new upcoming social media apps. What are some of those? Yeah, so um, I can't talk about any of the ones that we as a brand are considering um, joining just because we need to, you know, clear it with the NBA and make sure that like we're aligned and I don't want to promise anything. Um, but one that myself as a human is really excited about is called Locker Room. Um, it's an audio based app. Imagine kind of live podcasting um, or like an audio based Reddit. You know, you join the app. It's 100% audio based and there are rooms that are developed and there's a host and a guest and then you as a listener can actually ask to speak or be invited to speak. And then you just have this kind of conversation around whatever topic um, that the room is revolving on. So that's one that I'm personally excited about. I'm also personally as a human, not as GSW, excited about um, these new texting apps that are coming out. I, I don't know if you guys saw, but Obama started one recently. Um, a lot of celebrities have them too, where you can text the celebrity. Obviously, it's not actually them for the most part answering, but it does just feel like a lot more authentic and direct means of communication between you as the consumer and whoever you're texting. So I'm really interested to see the popularity of those and how popular they could potentially get. How do you come up with interesting hashtags to use? Hashtags, yeah. it's um. It's funny, hashtags are another one of those things where people just kind of think that they like happen on a whim. But if you guys could see like the amount of slacks back and forth about like a single letter or the capitalization or, you know, trying to decide between two hashtags or, you know, narrowing down the list, um, it's a lot. <laughs> and we first, I mean, we create hashtags around campaigns or events. Um, so for instance, you know, like the draft is coming up. And so we're already working really closely with marketing about how we're going to be marketing the NBA draft and what the overall marketing plans are and how social media fits into that marketing strategy. Um, 
And from there, you know, they might create a title for the draft. And so that's where we start is the title for the draft or the campaign and then the slogan for the campaign. And then we look at it and we're saying like, okay, what's hashtagable from that? Is it the entire title? Is it too long? Is it the slogan? Is that too long? Is it too weird? Does it not make sense in a sentence? Could we use it in a sentence versus does it have to just be tacked on at the end? And then we create an entire list. Um, myself, my coordinators, we do have a copywriter on staff who primarily works with marketing, but we pull him in um, because he is really great at hashtags because he's a copywriter. Um, and we create an entire list and then we just whittle down that list. Um, and by the end of it, you know, we make sure that we communicate whatever hashtags we're gonna use with whoever's project managing the campaign, make sure it fits, we get sign off, and then we're good to use the hashtag. So again, not a super sexy process, but one that requires um, kind of a lot more time and thought than most people might traditionally think. I actually have a question. Um, besides the players, do you guys have any other influencer relationships? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm just trying to think of, you know, most of the time our influencer relationships, um, they happen in real life. So they'll, you know, be at the game um, and they'll be sitting courtside or wherever else. And so some of those folks are, you know, E40, Too Short, Zendaya, Andy Samberg, Guy Fieri. They're kind of our big, like really like A-list. I don't know if Guy Fieri is an A-list celebrity, but whatever, A, B list celebrity, um, who like come to the games and they interact with our content on social. I know Jack, who's the CEO of Twitter, he interacts with our content on social. They're kind of like the top tier ones. We do also maintain um, influencer relationships with influencers that are based in China and um, Korea. And so CC, who's my Weibo coordinator, she has an entire list of influencers um, from like K-pop groups to Chinese actors and actresses who she works with for them to create content for our Weibo platform specifically and sometimes our domestic platforms as well um, and also for their own platforms. And that's something that's really important on Weibo specifically because especially with K-pop um, and our Asian audience, like that's just such a massive fandom for them. And so, um, you know, if you guys spend time online, which I'm sure you do, I'm sure you see like, you know, whenever um, K-pop groups take over a hashtag and then all of a sudden it's all fan cams instead of whatever the hashtag was supposed to be. Like they have so much power and influence on the internet. And so getting the K-pop groups and Chinese actors, actresses, stars, whomever they may be affiliated with our brand online, um, we're naturally pulling their fan base in as well. So those are kind of our buckets of influencers that we work with. How did you pivot your strategy strategy to adjust to the COVID season? Yeah, that was, um, yeah, it was a lot. So I'll just talk to you guys like through that weekend and how that went. So the COVID hit came to the United States. Um, we were playing at Chase Center. We had a game. And then the day after my birthday, actually, the NBA announced that the season was going on a hiatus um, due to COVID. And the first thing that we do is we regroup internally. Um, so I was really, really tight with our SVP of marketing and our SVP of public relations that entire weekend, because this happened on a Thursday, if I remember correctly, just to make sure that we have our overall communications and marketing strategy aligned across the board. Um, before we put anything out publicly. And I'm very lucky at GSW that they understand that social media, you know, we have 46 million followers online. Like they get that I can't just go do whatever, that we need to all be aligned and that I need to be kept in the loop. So that way social can be in lockstep with any other kind of external communication strategy. Um, from there, we released two statements. Um, you know, there's still a lot in the air, up in the air about like, is this temporary? Is this only gonna be a two week thing? Is this gonna be a multiple month thing? Is this the end of the season? Is it not? What's gonna happen? Um, and so we just tried to be as transparent online as we could. And so we put out the statements um, as you know, like common themes in terms of reactions were bubbling up. I would raise them to our SVP of PR and marketing to keep them in the loop of how our fans are reacting to what's going on. 
And then from there, we uh, worked with our healthcare partner, Kaiser Permanente, to put out a series of COVID-related messaging. Um, this was important to us, one, so that way we could directly address what is going on. You know, the pandemic was a it is a global issue. We have a global fan base. We have a reach that is way bigger than Kaiser Permanente. And so we were taking their authority in the COVID and healthcare space, partnering it with our reach and our branding to make sure that it hits more eyeballs. And we created the COVID preparedness um, content franchise. After we pumped out you know, some of those messages, again, just like so much monitoring of conversation and fan sentiment online, it was becoming apparent that social media was becoming an even more toxic place than it normally is. Um, you know, people were doom scrolling where you just like, you can't stop scrolling, you can't stop looking at what's going on. Um, every time that you logged on, it was COVID, 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 and just like a lot of panic and fear and uncertainty. And so we were like, okay, we need to, we still need to pump out COVID related messaging because it's important to our fan base because we want them to stay healthy. But we also need to start working in some content that's based in basketball and joy. So that way our feed becomes um, kind of a little bit of an oasis in what was the, the desert of gloom. Um, and so we started folding in some basketball content, some player-based personality content, just to try to bring some joy back to the timeline while still acknowledging COVID. Um, so that was our content strip shift, excuse me. Um, we still are working with Kaiser Permanente and making sure that, you know, as they refine, revise, or want to push out messaging as it continues, that we're on board as well and that we're creating assets that we feel comfortable putting out on our channels to help them with that. Because while we might have all thought initially that this was only going to be a one month thing, obviously we're now over six months into it. Um, and we do have a responsibility just with our platform size and our audience reach to acknowledge it and do what we can um, to help our followers with that. Erin, I'm gonna ask a question. Um, and this may be a sensitive topic and you can just say, I'm not able to address this, but I know that the Warriors channel has been very vocal on just like the social unrest that's happening in the country and promoting like Black Lives Matter. And we see it all across the NBA, the players really being, outspoken about what they're seeing and externalizing their reaction to it. How did you, how do you all navigate that as a brand to still be kind of in that wave and that momentum while also kind of um, maintaining your overall brand voice and brand mission? Yeah, so um, I can definitely answer that. So, I mean, the first thing before I answer that specifically is I always, I don't get on my soapbox too often, but when I do, it's usually about when and how brands should insert themselves into conversations. And obviously, not every brand should insert themselves into every conversation. You need to make sure if it's right for your brand and your organization. For the Warriors, for the entire NBA, obviously, that answer was yes. You know, it's no secret. We all work for a league who the majority of athletes are Black, and so we needed to make sure that our organization channels across the board, not just on social media, but those are the most visible, are coming out very vocally, very strongly in support of the Black Lives Matter movement and racial equity in general. Luckily, GSW is a very progressive organization. Um, it starts at the top. You know, Rick Waltz, he's our president. He's the only openly gay NBA president. Steve Kerr, if you follow him on Twitter, he's incredibly progressive and outspoken. So all of that starts at the top in terms of establishing the culture of the organization. And so when the resurgence of that movement started to occur, personally, I immediately connected with our SVP of PR once again. And I was like, hey, we need to be a part of this conversation early, often, and loudly. Um, and it was fine. Like it was, you know, our organization from top to bottom understands how like what we stand for as a brand that we need to use our platforms to support our players and our coaches however we best can um and so that's that's a conversation that happened internally and then in terms of externally you know i mentioned culture and fit um this extends to the players as well you know there's obviously i'm not on our basketball ops staff but i assume that when you know you want to 
check out players, you want to make sure that they fit culturally as well as their actual skills on the court. And so that coupled with our organization priority around the matter made it, you know, it was just like we were comfortable amplifying our players and our alum and our coaches voices on the topic in the space. Um, I wasn't concerned about any kind of like blowback from anyone um, other than like awful people online, but that happens regardless of what we do. Um, and so we felt empowered as a social team to straight up amplify our players' voices in terms of retweeting and sharing posts to stories and all of that, but then also making our players aware that our channels and our platforms are their platform as well. Um, you know, with the exception of some of our big players like Stephen Curry, we have more followers on our channel than most of our roster. And so we needed to make sure that they understood, one, we support you, two, we are here for you to get out any kind of message um, that you want if you want more ears on it. And so this um, happened, I think probably most prominently in July, I wanna say, or June. One of our players, Juan Toscano Anderson, he's a Bay Area native, um, he organized two peaceful rallies um, and he you know, had the roster out there and he actually invited us to come cover the rallies for him from our Warriors handles, like as a brand to show the team support and to just make, like gather more awareness for what he was doing. And so that to me signaled like, we're doing the right thing. We're using our channels how we should. And we have the players trust um, and the players know that we're there to help them amplify their message. Um, so that's kind of what we've been doing. You know, we still do it. it it's still going on. Um, if you guys follow the Warriors, you'll see yesterday, you know, some of the players were wearing Justice for Breonna Taylor t-shirts. Um, they addressed it in media availability. We made sure to publish that content to, again, use our platforms to make it clear what we stand for as an organization and also that we're supporting our players. So then your second part of your question, how do we do that and still manage our brand voice? Um, I think it's kind of one and the same, you know, like our stance on it and what we're doing is part of our brand voice. So we didn't have to really consider how to balance it because it already was one. Excellent, excellent. Well, um, we just, on behalf of the class, I just want to thank you for being here again. Um, I'm gonna invite you back every year until you tell me no, pretty Good. much. <laughs> <laughs> Because I think this is so valuable for them to have this kind of time with someone um, on the ground working at a very strategic level who's had public relations, strategic community. So they are writing press releases and it helps contextualize, well, how does this fit with social media? No, these are the steps. You have to be a great writer in order to be a good, uh, excellent strategic communicator. So um, everybody, let's thank uh, Ms. Karen Ramming for being with us, the emojis. You can just open your mics and say thank you. Let her know. Show your face. Anything. No. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And yeah, if you guys want, I always make myself available. Um, Twitter is the easiest way to, to get a hold of me. If you guys wanted to connect 